Hello everyone and welcome to the Winter Colloquium on Precision Medicine held by the Young Scientists Association of the Medical University of Vienna. My name is Karina and together with my colleague Nichelle, we will host today's meeting. We are indeed very excited to welcome our speakers today who will talk on their research and also we are very happy to welcome our audience at this colloquium. Precision medicine is an innovative approach to tailoring disease prevention and treatment that takes into account differences in people's genes, environments and lifestyles. The goal of precision medicine is to target the right treatments to the right patients at the right time. Precision medicine is a broad field and today we will get insight from three different viewpoints. With this, I would like to introduce our first speaker already. So here we have Professor Leo Anthony Selly. He has practiced medicine in three different continents, giving him a broad perspective into healthcare delivery. As a clinical research director and a principal research scientist at the MIT Laboratory of Computational Physiology, he brings together clinicians and data scientists who are supporting the research using data that is routinely collected from intensive care units. Professor Selly also founded and co-directs SANA, which is a cross-disciplinary organization, and it is based at the Institute of Medical Engineering and Science at MIT, wh whose objective is to leverage information technology to improve the health outcomes in low- and middle-income countries. Today, he will talk about how health AI and precision medicine would fail without data sharing. Professor Selly, the stage is now yours. Yeah, no, I just wanted to clarify. I, I did not know that there are three speakers, so I'm going to have to cut my talk. I, I wasn't told. Uh, I, I, I was. So let, if you could clarify for me how much time I have, because I, I'm going to have to mm -hmm. cut my slides radically. Yes, yeah, so you would have a 20 minute talk from you and maybe 10 minutes for questions further. Okay, so uh, apologies in advance. Uh, I, I, I wish I was told that I, I'm one of three uh, speakers because I prepared a 30 minute talk. So um, let, let, let's see, I'm probably so gonna worries. skip a lot of it. Um, my name is Leo Anthony Sally. I work in the intensive care unit at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I'm a pre, uh, principal research scientist at MIT. Um, and before I proceed, uh, I wanted to disclose that our group reserves, receives research funding from the National Institute of Health and from several industry partners. I'm gonna skip the next few slides, unfortunately, uh, and I'm gonna try to stop in uh, 10 minutes, but please let me know next time how much time I'm, I'm given. Uh, anyway, I think the biggest hype that we read about last year was this headline saying that 2022 is the year that AI is finally living up to its hype. I, we still think that this is not the case. And to us, this is a hype headline in itself. And I'm just gonna review some of the major developments that happened in 2022. In April last year, OpenAI announced DALI2, which is a deep learning image synthesis model that generates images from text prompts thanks to a technique called latent diffusion. And this, um, this technology became available to everyone by September of last year. And then in July, DeepMind announced that its AlphaFold AI model had predicted the shape of almost every known protein with the sequenced genome. And uh, DeepMind actually made all the predicted protein structures available in a public database hosted by the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, allowing researchers from all over the world to access them and use the data for research related to medicine and biological science. In August, Stability AI and Cognvest released Stable Diffusion, which arrive as an open source project complete with source code and checkpoint files. And people can use Stable Diffusion locally and privately on their uh, PCs if they have enough GPU. But soon critics complain about the software's potential to create political disinformation, non-consensual pornography, child sex abuse material, and alternative histories. Later that month, a uh, Colorado resident named Jason Allen won the top prize in a digital arts photography category with an AI-generated image 
called Teatro de Opera Special and people flipped out. In November, Meta announced Cicero, an AI agent that beat humans at an online strategy board game called Diplomacy. But Diplomacy is different from Go. Diplomacy is a social game where players talk to each other. It requires extensive persuasion, cooperation, and negotiation to win. And Cicero uh, fooled the other humans into thinking that they were playing with another human. And of course, last month, ChatGPT made a splash. Uh, it's a chatbot based on the chat uh, on the GPT-3 language model. It makes probabilistic guesses about which bits of text belong together in a sequence based on a statistic, a statistical model trained on billions of examples of text pulled from all over the internet. And this is the first time such a powerful tool was made available to the public through a free, easy to use web interface. And people started using it to write essays and poetry, generate recipes, and help with programming tasks, among others. It even spots and fixes code errors. Five days after its launch, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman tweeted that ChatGPT has reached over 1 million users. I'll skip this slide. And almost immediately, developers created AI to spot AI. And to some people, they saw this as the beginning of the end, AI outing and ultimately destroying AI. But we don't hear about some of the horror stories that have resulted from errors and failures of AI. Uh, this is a headline in the New York Times talking about this gentleman here who was arrested for shoplifting and running into a police officer because he was falsely identified by a facial recognition AI. And there are tons and tons of stories like this. Some have asked, given enough data and computational resources, is everything predictable? In 2017, investigators at Princeton University tried to answer that question. They organized a prediction competition using over 10,000 data points about children collected based on hours and hours of observation, as well as in-depth interviews with each family, hundreds of researchers aim to predict how well that kid is gonna do over the next few years. And similar to this meme, the Princeton investigators were massively disappointed to find that the latest deep learning techniques barely perform better than simple linear regression with just four pieces of information about the children including their race and the educational level of their mother. It turns out that AI sucks when, there's no, when there, there are no clear uh, rules and when reasonable people like us can disagree about the right answer. And yet many companies and startups claim that their products can predict the future. For example, HireVue claims to predict future performance of job applicants using questions such as, is your desk uh, messy or is it clean to infer applicants' personalities? That's basically astrology or tarot card reading. And yet this tool decides the fate of millions of people every month who are applying for a job. EIB Navigate claims to predict which high school students will drop out of college during application. And the Allegheny Family Screening Tool claims to predict when, which children are at risk of being uh, maltreated by their parents. Unfortunately, their proprietary algorithms are never subjected to rigorous evaluation for errors and bias. It is important to emphasize that majority of VCs and angel investors could not give a fuck about bias. AI is notoriously bad at nuance and context. For example, Google's algorithms reported a man to the police and terminated his account, causing him to lose access to more than a decade of contacts, emails, and photos because he took a picture of his baby's uh, infected genitals to send to the doctor. Predictably, the algorithms mistook this for ch child sexual abuse imagery. There are thousands and thousands of stories like this. AI, uh, a cornerstone of scientific progress is the ability of independent researchers to verify results. Worryingly, research in AI falls short. For example, out of 400 recent papers in the top AI conferences, none documented their methods in enough detail such that an independent team could verify their research and, um, and report whether it is correct. This is uh, highlighted in this paper in the top from Gunderson and Kiansmo. 
And as a result, there are widespread errors due to adopting AI in at least 70 different fields, as highlighted by another report from Princeton University. How about healthcare? Is healthcare different? We read cringe-worthy headlines like this week after another. Could healthcare be different from other fields when it comes to AI applications? The immediate answer, the, the short answer is no. Out of 415 published AI tools developed to combat COVID during the pandemic, with the best resources available, not one was fit for clinical use. These are two examples that were deployed during the pandemic. The first one was predicting which patients are going to deteriorate over time so that they can be appropriately triaged. There's another one that uh, was supposed to help clinicians identify uh, hard to, uh, to, 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 pick, to uh, diagnose with sepsis. And a few months after their release, uh, they were shown to be really of unacceptable performance. And they were later pulled and recalibrated uh, in the midst of the pandemic. And I'll skip this. Uh, 2016 was the year when a landmark investigative report uh, was published by ProPublica, um, shining a spotlight on an algorithm called Compass that is used in judicial courts across the United States. It's supposed to inform uh, judges in terms of the risk of a prisoner reoffending when they're applying for parole. And it found that the algorithm was biased towards Black and Hispanic prisoners, overestimating their risk of reoffending. And while for white prisoners, it underestimated their risk of reoffending. And it has been more than five years, seven years since this, um, this report was published. And we have not fixed this problem. All we have accomplished is realizing how difficult it is to prevent AI from perpetuating societal biases through algorithms. So what have we learned? We've learned that um, adequate representation of all groups is important, but it's not gonna fix bias. It's not gonna prevent algorithms from perpetuating any inequities that we see now. We've become more self-critical. We've, 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 we're slowly realizing that a lot of the lectures that we learn in medical school and during residency training are understanding of health and disease the physiology, pathophysiology, and mechanistic models that we memorized, uh, they are based on research that is likely biased. They're primarily observations of white people in rich countries. Uh, Decision-making as documented in electronic health records is laced with a lot of sub unconscious and implicit human bias. And most recently, medical device and health technology uh, that we use in hospitals and clinic uh, are designed around an exclusive demographic and they don't work accurately outside of that demographic. When we train a model to optimize an outcome from a set of features pertaining to the patient and the disease, we assume that treatment decisions are the same across similar patients, but they are not. These are papers from our group demonstrating that the outcomes uh, for sepsis vary across hospitals here in the United States after adjusting for illness severity and other clinical confounders. Also, we have proof that the concordance in the sex as well as in the race of the provider and the patient uh, strongly influences outcomes. There was a paper from December of 2021 that showed that women who are operated on by female surgeons have better outcomes than those who are operated on by male surgeons. So what is the impact if we're using this data that is laced with bias to come up with prediction models, optimization models. For those of us in the exciting field of medical AI, we need to remind ourselves that the data that is routinely collected in the process of care, the building blocks of AI are heavily influenced by longstanding social, cultural, and institutional biases, as well as provider subjectivity and decision-making. I'll skip this one. There's another source of bias in the data that I alluded to earlier. The devices and equipment that we use are themselves biased. Our group published this paper in July of this year. This is looking at pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry has been in the headlines for the last few years since the pandemic. As you know, it's a medical device that approximates the amount of oxygen in the bloodstream. And it's been shown that it doesn't perform well among individuals of color. And in this paper, we show that we were under treating 
uh, patients of color. We were not giving them enough oxygen because we were fooled by the technology that we're using. We just assumed that pulse oximetry works consistently across different patients, but it turns out to be wrong. And we likely harmed or even killed patients before because uh, we were relying on a technology that does not perform well in certain demographics. Again, how will this impact downstream prediction tasks, optimization tasks? And pulse oximetry is likely just the tip of the iceberg. Every equipment that we have evaluated has shown inconsistent accuracy across the different demographics. Uh, we all know about sphygmomanometers not working well for people who are uh, large or who are, who are tiny. Uh, we, there was a study on thermometry, temporal thermometry, that also doesn't pick up the temperature well if you're of color because it uses infrared sensing technology. We know that EZGs are hard to read for very large-breasted women or for morbidly obese patients because the amplitude is small. So again, there is a litany of medical device, medical products that are being used that are collecting data that uh, the numbers are not reliable. So you, a, a certain number might mean different, whether you're black or white, whether you're straight or gay, whether you're old or young. And this is all gonna impact the, the models that we're building to inform decision-making. And the last study that I'm going to present is a study that we published about a year ago now, where we demonstrated that computers could learn on their own the race ethnicity of an, a patient just based on medical imaging without even giving them any data. And the most perplexing thing is that we cannot um, understand what the computers are learning. And of course, we've seen this as well with Fundus Photos, where they've demonstrated that artificial intelligence could determine the rate, the, 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 the sex of the patient, whether they're male or female, just based on the fundus photos alone. And then more concerning is the fact that AI could tell you if you're rich or poor, just based on your chest x-ray. Uh, we are training chest x-rays with negative findings that are nor oral normal, and computers are picking up which x-rays belong to rich people, and which x-rays belong to poor people. And why is this important? It's important um, and it's concerning if computers can identify these sensitive attributes uh, in, from, the, from medical images, from waveforms, even if we think um, we are not providing that information because if they can do this, they will use this information to make decisions, to make predictions, to optimize an outcome. And of course, uh, this is not what we intend with AI. What's going to happen is that all our biases are going to be legitimized, going to be perpetuated, and are going to be scaled. And this is the last thing that we want to happen. We don't want the inequities that we're seeing now to be permanently ingrained in the practice of medicine. And with that, I'm going to cut this talk short so that we, there's uh, time for the other speakers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much for this, uh, Professor Seri, for this very interesting talk and the exciting insight into your work. And uh, we have some questions uh, for you. So first one, a crucial problem facing EI research is data focused on specific regions and diseases that are then used to validate and train the algorithm, resulting in lack of generalizability over the global EI research landscape. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how we can overcome this? Um, so we're trying to convince the AI community not to look for generalizable models. Uh, we publish a paper called The Myth of Generalizability. And this is true as well for the rest of medicine. Uh, what we found is that uh, our recommendations for treatment, and the same thing with algorithms, would really only apply for uh, a certain subset of patients. So we highly, highly in discourage patenting and selling of AI. We think that trying to build AI using data from the United States and then selling them in, in Austria, in Vienna, is going to kill a lot of Austrians because the relationship of the features 
with the outcome or with a certain uh, disease diagnosis is going to be different here in the United States and, and in Vienna. Uh, so, so if there are entrepreneurs out there, I tell you now, stop trying to develop AI that you intend to sell to hospitals and clinics because you're likely going to be killing patients in doing that. The business model should be each healthcare organization building their own uh, AI pipeline. I know that's gonna be difficult because some hospitals do not have the resources, do not have the expertise. And in those reason we, and for those reasons, we want some hospitals to band together, partner up with large academic institutions so that they could assist with, uh, with building a data pipeline for you. But all AI models should be local. All AI models need to be monitored after they get deployed because they might be accurate now, but I could tell you they won't be accurate a year from now or even a few months from now, in which case you might be killing people uh, a few months from now if you're not very careful. So AI is very different from drugs or from medical device because AI needs to be continuously recalibrated. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you very much. We still have some time for another question. So, uh, how can data sharing be on a global uh, on a global level when each country has their own policies? Um, we are promoting this concept of trusted research environment. So, the rest of my slides are trying to convince you that the old strategy where each institution will have their own investigators build the AI without a lot of input from non-internal investigators is probably gonna be uh, harmful. It's probably gonna uh, prevent AI from truly transforming and improving the way we deliver care. The A, as I, as I explained very, I, th I thought quite clearly in my talk, the biases that exist in the data are very complex. One group will not have all the expertise. Um, our data set that we use is publicly available. We have about 35,000 users who are all examining the data for bias, who are all trying to understand how the data can ultimately um, find their way into the algorithms. And we think that this is the only way to do it. The data has to be looked at by as large a group of people with varying expertise, with varying perspectives. MIT is not smart enough to be able to do that. We need to partner with our colleagues from around the world, from different disciplines, so that we understand all the, the, the bias that exists in the data. So somehow we need to change the way we do research. In the past, it's like one institution performing their research within their own silos, they're competing for funding, they're trying to compete for a publication in nature, and we think that that approach is ultimately gonna harm the population, and we need to change that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and thank you very much once again, Professor Fetzeli, for your um, very interesting presentation, and please uh, stay with us, because at the end of the meeting, we will have short panel discussion with all three speakers, and I would like to remind our audience to send uh, their questions in Slido. So, thank you. And with this, <clears throat> I would like to introduce our next speaker. So, um, as our speakers from Norganoids were unable to join us due to health issues, we greatly appreciate Dr. Birgit Fendt, who has agreed to share her research with us on such a short uh, notice. Dr. Birgit Fendt works at the Christian Doppler Laboratory for Personalized Immunotherapy, which is run by Professor Matthias Preusa at the Division of Oncology. It aims to provide a comprehensive 360 degrees biomarker, including various tissue-based, blood-based, and radiology-based information of a particular patient for prediction of response to immune checkpoint inhibition. In her main research, she works on cancer cell, immune cell interaction, especially with a focus on monocytes and macrophages, as well as on extracellular vesicles and their role in cancer. So thank you once again for being here, Dr. Fent, and the stage is yours. 
Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope you hear me and you see my presentation. Yes. Perfect. So thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce today our 30, 360 degree biomarker for personalized immunotherapy. So our big vision is an individual immunotherapy for each individual. And the basis for our research for this is the cancer immunity cycle. So all of the single steps of this immunity cycle have to be working to have an effective anti-cancer response. So we start with the antigen release via tumor, the uptake via the dendritic cells, then the transport via the lymphatic system to the lymph node, where the antigen is presented to a naive T cell, which is then activated, and then travels back via the bloodstream to the tumor, where it exerts its cytotoxic effect on the tumor. However, tumor cells have found various ways how to escape this uh, immune response. And one of these mechanisms uh, are immune checkpoints. Uh, I assume you have come across immune checkpoints already uh, in the context of immune tolerance. So in the context of cancer, uh, these cancer cells, uh, they express uh, or they can express PDL1, the broken cell death ligand 1. And so when the tumor cell interacts with the T cell via the MHC complex and the T cell receptor, this uh, co-expression of PD1 on the T cells and PDL1 on the tumor cells, they interact and this leads then to, let's say, like an arrest of the T cell in its state and it's not able to uh, attack the tumor cell anymore. With 2014, uh, so-called immune checkpoint inhibitor antibodies were introduced in the clinical application, and these antibodies, they either target PD-1 or PDL1, and via this blockade, they reactivate the T cells, which then are again able to attack the tumor cells. And with this introduction of immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, this was a real revolution in uh, therapy of solid cancer. However, this milestone is still a little bit um, a little bit limited because the response rate is between 16 and 60 percent, strongly dependent on the cancer cell type. So we have two big aims within our Christian Doppler laboratory. First of all, we are searching for new modulatory approaches uh, for new treatments, mainly studying the interaction of monocytes and cancer cells, but we also focus on inflammatory changes over time and disease progression. And furthermore, we are also studying factors which causes uh, immunotherapy resistance. The second big aim is the development of biomarkers to predict the response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, where we want to have a 360 degree biomarker where we can address all the single steps of the cancer immunity cycle and also combine this with radiological surrogate parameter. So on this slide, you see an overview of all our single projects within our lab, trying to cover all these single steps of the cancer immunity cycle. Uh, our main pillows are new antigen signatures, uh, the T cell receptor repertoire, tissue DNA methylation, and also the methylation pattern of uh, leukocyte-derived DNA. So within my today's talk, I want to introduce you two of our sub-projects. First of all, tissue DNA methylation, and uh, as a second one, the surface cell marker profiling of monocytes. So about the methylation profiling in our lab, with this method, we want to uh, characterize the, the tumor microenvironment and how this determines the response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So uh, in our lab, methylation is our, uh, our main and core method. We use here the Infinium Methylation Epic B-chip microarray uh, um, from Illumina, where we can um, analyze up to 850,000 850, uh, CPG sites, uh, where we want to study which of these uh, genes are either hypo or hypermethylated. And the big advantage with this method is that we can use FFPE material, which is the most common source uh, for uh, for tumor biopsies, but we can also use fresh tumors or even blood of, uh, blood derived DNA. It's a very stable uh, uh, technique, and in comparison with other omics methods, it's uh, it's cheaper, and it's already used for um, for diagnosis. So in clinical routine, uh, it is used to uh, classify primary tumors in the central nervous system. 
So in our project, we started with the characterization of sarcoma patients. And in total, we had a cohort of 35 patients, 20 from, uh, from, our, uh, from our university, and 15 um, uh, cases were from the university hospital in Essen. And all these patients uh, showed progression after standard therapy and then received an anti-PD-1 immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, either with pembrolizumab or nivolumab. What we found is that the overall response rate in these patients to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy was quite low, only 22.9%, and uh, the clinical benefit was slightly higher with, with 65%. For all these patients, the median progression-free survival was about three months and 60.5 months with the median overall survival. Besides methylation, we also performed classical immunohistochemistry, where we checked the expression of PDL1 and uh, different subsets of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And additionally, we also checked the tumor mutational burden. But none of these factors, and also not a systemic inflammation course, none of them were associated uh, with uh, the response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy in this patient cohort. However, when we performed methylation analysis, we found 2,453 differentiated, differentially uh, expressed uh, methylated uh, uh, clusters, so two uh, genes, sorry. And uh, these uh, genes could be clustered into two different uh, clusters. So one containing only the responders and the second methylation cluster containing 73 uh, sorry, one cluster with all non-responders and one uh, cluster containing 73 uh, responders. And interestingly, these two uh, clusters, they were independent of the sarcoma subtype and of the tumor cell infiltration. So here you see two Kaplan-Meier curves comparing these two methylation clusters. So the first one with the responders showing a higher progression-free survival and also a higher overall survival. And uh, the second one with the non-responders with a lower progression-free and overall survival uh, showing a correlation of the methylation profile with the response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And next, we extended our uh, patient's entity with uh, patients resistant, uh, resistant or metastatic head and neck squamous skull carcinoma. And uh, in this case, we found, found about 60,000 differentially methylated CPG sites. And uh, we then decided just to focus on the top 1,000. And within this top 1,000, we found four different clusters. And one of these clusters contained only the responders. So again, also in this patient cohort, we found uh, that methylation profiling uh, can predict the response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, this information, which genes are differentially methylated, we also use or will use for our basic research, where we focus on these genes which show uh, hypo or hypermethylation. Here you see an overview of uh, single pathways uh, um, dysregulated uh, in our sarcoma patients, and we will use this also in our basic research projects for, uh, uh, for functional investigations. So uh, in this context, we aim for an entity agnostic tumor tissue methylation profile based on which we want to pr uh, predict the response to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So therefore, we are um, collecting a lot of different patient entities. We are uh, currently working on the lung cancer uh, cohort and on uh, a melanoma cohort, but uh, we'll also uh, build up uh, a cohort for patients with triple negative breast cancer or renal cell carcinoma. And additionally, we are also working on methylation profiling from uh, blood-derived leukocytes and their DNA to combine our uh, tissue-based and liquid biopsy approach. So finally, what we want to have is uh, an, an old classifier web tool where uh, based uh, on the methylation profile predict immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy response. So now the, to the second subproject I want to introduce you today is about monocyte subsets and newly draft suppressor cells. We decided to focus on another type of immune cells besides T cells, um, because so far the focus on the other immune cells have been yeah, quite limited. However, there, uh, 
there is in, there are yeah there are hints that the efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy depends on uh, innate immune cells and that these antibodies may also alter uh, these cell types and our focus now here is uh, monocytes and macrophages, macrophages especially because they present uh, the major uh, immune cell type in solid tumors. And additionally, we also added immune uh, direct suppressor cells here as they possess immunosuppressive properties. So just a little background to monocyte subsets. Um, they can be characterized based on their CD14 and CD16 expression using flow cytometry. We have the classical ones expressing CD14 but lacking CD16, intermediate monocytes expressing both markers CD14 and to a low degree CD16, and the non-classical monocytes quite the opposite with a stronger expression for CD16. But all of these three subgroups, they carry HLADR. They possess uh, various properties, and in uh, various diseases, they have been described to be altered in their distribution. And there's already some uh, some publications out uh, with in vitro and also animal models where they showed that the tumor cells uh, seem to have an effect on this monocyte subset distribution. In contrast to monocytes, newly directed pressor cells uh, differ via, as they are lacking HLADR. Uh, they can be characterized then via the expression of CD14, CD11B, and CD33, and they lack in CD16. And as I already said, they possess immunosuppressive properties and have also been described uh, to be altered in cancer patients. And we especially decided to include this subset also in this project at their ER. Uh, first hints that uh, monocytes might be reprogrammed under certain under certain circumstances to merely drive suppressor cells with these immunosuppressive properties. So in this project, we have three aims. First of all, to characterize uh, these monocyte subsets and merely drive suppressor cells in patients undergoing immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Later on, we also want to verify uh, how these changes could be mediated in an in vitro model, uh, also to evaluate the effect of the tumor cells and the therapeutic antibodies. So currently, we are uh, collecting a patient cohort consisting of uh, patients with non-small cell lung cancer and uh, or head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Both cohorts receiving either immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, uh, inhibitors plus minus chemotherapy. And additionally, we have a pancreatic cancer cohort with chemotherapy only as a control. So we are recruiting at, uh, each 10, uh, 10 patients, all of them therapy naive. Additionally, we um, have a control cohort consisting of healthy individuals, uh, 10 in total without any known cancer, uh, autoimmune cardiovascular disease, any injuries or inflammations, and uh, also non-smokers. Here you have an overview of our experimental setup for this ex vivo analysis. So in total, we draw blood three times from our patients uh, before they start therapy at the first restaging and in case we see them at the second restaging. For our control cohort, we just chose two time points uh, six weeks apart uh, to uh, to imitate this um, this uh, this time course between baseline and and, and restaging, and this blood is then uh, used for a, a fourteen color a flow cytometric staining followed by analysis. So we uh, designed a gating strategy uh, using lysed whole blood as a starting material. So first of all, we exclude NK cells based on their, CD, uh, on their expression of CD56. Then we exclude T and B cells and a gate on CD45 expressing leukocytes. Within this population, then we discriminate between HLADR expressing monocytes and uh, the negative population then for the merely drive suppressor cell characterization. So within the HLADR positive population, we identify, we first uh, exclude the granulocytes where the expression of CD66B, and then we discriminate between the classical, the intermediate, and the non-classical monocytes. For our HLADR negative population, we identify the muley direct suppressor cells via the expression of CD11B and CD33. And then finally, we also uh, discriminate in three subpopulations 
via CD14 and CD15 expression. So we have here the polymorph uh, nucleic. Uh, Mule drive to press the cells in the monocytic lineage and an early or often uh, or also called um, immature lineage. So we already have finished our characterization of our control patient cohort. You see here the monocyte subsets in grade the baseline and in, in, in create the, the follow-up uh, sample. And uh, the distribution of these three subsets is comparable with literature for healthy volunteers. And importantly, we have seen no significant changes over time. So, so they, they stay steady in, in the body un, uh, unless you get some, some inflammation or disease. Uh, similar picture for muley draft suppressor cells. We, we do not see any difference uh, between baseline uh, and follow-up. So for our patient cohort, currently we have included nine patients with non-small cell lung cancer. For six, we already have a follow-up. Two patients with uh, uh, had a next squamous cell carcinoma for pancreatic pancreatic but with no follow-up. So you see here uh, a first insight uh, of our interim analysis. So here now for our patients with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so with therapy, uh, the monocyte, uh, the classical monocytes decrease, and uh, in the same, you have an increase in intermediate and non-classical monocytes in contrast to our uh, to our healthy controls. Here, first data on the distribution for HNSCC and the pancreatic cancer patients, we are still lacking the data for the follow-up and uh, the additionally baseline samples. Here, uh, our mullet derived suppressor cells, in contrast to our healthy control cohort, you see that uh, the mullet derived suppressor cells in its subpopulations, they show a much higher uh, um, uh, deviation. And only for one now for the mullet lineage, we see a significant change over therapy. So with this I want to close my talk um, uh, just presenting our translation research goal. So uh, on, in the short run, we want to have all our biomarker analysis uh, running. Some, uh, some of them are still in development just to, to target all each steps of the cancer immunity cycle to have then uh, all these methods ready for validation of our 360 degree biomarker approach in a prospective cohort. So uh, to have then in the long run and a tumor agnostic clinical trial um, with an inclusion of patients based on this uh, biomarker approach. And with this, I want to thank our funding agency, the Christian Doppler Laboratory Society, our industry partner, Roche, um, my colleagues from the Division of Oncology, Teresa Haziano, and uh, Evin, uh, and Erwin Tuvasich, who keep our uh, methylation pipeline running, Gavin Heller, who does the bioinformatic analysis uh, for us, uh, our clinicians, uh, uh, and uh, then for the monocyte project, it's Karina Peichel, who is doing the experiments, our biobank, who screen our patients uh, on a daily basis for inclusion in our individual projects, and all our in, uh, col uh, collaboration partners, and finally, you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Fendel. That was a very interesting talk with some great study design and also neat results. Um, I would like to urge the audience to ask some questions on our Slido chat. And maybe I can start with the first one. This is quite a general question, but how do you think that um, lifestyle, lifestyle of the individual patient influences the outcome of your immunotherapy? And are there some kind of tools or how you can, like useful tools to expand the testing of these variables? So what we um, what we already do is so when my, our patients come in, they uh, first of all we we draw blood, but they also get questionnaires about uh, their well being, how uh, how they do during the cycle of therapies and so on. So we all have this record how the patients are doing. We also have. Um, outside our Christian Doppler laboratory, another project running where we have a fitness tracker. So where we really monitor the patients even when they are at home. So this is also a, da a data we will uh, fuse with, uh, in the future, hopefully with the Christian Doppler laboratory that we can also take uh, something like the physical state of the patients into account. And also we are thinking about projects where we study the microbiota of the patients. Also a very important aspect where there are already some studies indicating that this can have an influence on, uh, on the therapy. 
This is very interesting. Thank you. And we will also ask more questions from our audience in the panel discussion at the ending. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I Thank would you also very much. like to let the audience know that we will do a short 10 to 15 minutes break. So we would come back at 5 p.m. So take some time to stretch your legs, refill your cups of coffee, and we will see you soon at 5 p.m.
Welcome back to the Winter Colloquium. Now I would like to introduce our third speaker, Professor Sabina Achinger. She is a specialist in the internal medicine and hemato-oncology and has been employed at the University Clinic for Internal Medicine I at the Meduni Wien since 1988. She leads the anticoagulant outpatient clinic in the Department of Hematology and Hemostasiology. Her scientific focus is in the field of thrombosis. She is the head of the world's largest cohort study to record risk factors for venous thromboembolism. Professor Eichinger is a member of numerous international societies and editorial boards of renowned scientific journals. Today, she will talk about precision medicine in venous thrombosis. Welcome, Professor Eichinger. The stage is now yours. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction and the kind invitation. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it seems a little bit uh, unusual that we might also find something like precision or personalized medicine in venous thrombosis, but in fact, there is a lot to do there. So first of all, uh, let's focus a little bit on the disease. So what is a thrombosis? A thrombosis is uh, more or less a blood clot. And if the blood clot forms in the vein, then we have conditions like deep vein thrombosis. Um, and as a consequence, there might be pulmonary embolism. We will dig a little bit deeper into what is what um, in the next few minutes. So together, uh, these two terms, deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, are often uh, subsumed as uh, venous thromboembolism. So venous thromboembolism is only uh, the, the expression or the, the name of a condition which uh, comprises deep vein thrombosis with or without pulmonary embolism. In fact, uh, venous thrombosis cannot only be found in the legs. This is the most common uh, location of uh, venous thrombosis, but the blood can, blood can also form in the veins of the arms, the brain, the liver, kidney, ovaries, guts, uh, wherever there are veins, there can be uh, venous thrombosis. So how does this happen? We have the deep veins of the leg, and these uh, deep veins have valves. And uh, of course, these valves may uh, uh, create an obstacle in the blood flow. So the blood flow flows from distal to proximal, so from uh, the lower leg to the upper leg. And uh, when there is this, when there are these pockets of the valves, there might be some uh, obstacle here. And uh, the hypothesis is um, that the, the, the clots start to form in the, these pockets of the valves. If this is always the case, and if this is really uh, so, one does not know exactly, but this is uh, the, the, the hypothesis at the moment. So this is the clinical picture you might see in a patient with deep vein thrombosis of the leg. So the leg is swollen. The leg, uh, of course, this is painful. And uh, the further the thrombosis goes up, uh, the entire leg might be affected. And also, you, might you may find some discoloration. So what ha can happen now is that this clots, clot, which forms in the lower leg, as I said, this is the most uh, frequent location of deep vein thrombosis, that this uh, clot dislocates and then travels upwards the venous flow to the vena cava, from there to the right heart, from there to the right heart chamber into the lungs. And here the vessels get smaller and smaller and smaller to facilitate the oxygen uh, exchange. and the clot gets stuck, and this is the clinical picture of pulmonary embolism. So this uh, slide summarizes what I just said, and the part of the lung behind the occluded vessel will not be perfused, and so this might um, also be the area where we have pulmonary infarction. So what does this mean for the heart, the right heart, the right ventricle? beats against an increased resistance. This is like with a hose uh, where you 
uh, uh, with which you fill with water and if there is an an obstacle uh, then of course uh, this uh, may um, this may cause harm to the host and in this case it causes harm to the right heart and uh, there is the danger of right heart failure and uh, in worst case scenario the patient may die uh, we are talking about a fairly uh, frequent disease. So you can see here that in the general population, approximately one out of thousand persons uh, will have a venous thromboembolism, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism um, in, 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 uh, per, per year. You see here already one of the major risk factors for the disease, and this is age. So in a, a, persons older than 70 years, this disease, of course, is much more frequent. One in 100 um, elderly will have such a, an event. While it is fairly, fairly uncommon in women um, below the age of 45 years. So this means in Austria, for example, about 20,000 uh, persons per year will have uh, a venous thromboembolism or, and, uh, or deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. So about the pathophysiology, uh, when we are talking about the pathogenesis of venous thromboembolism, we can go back to uh, Dr. Virchow. He was a pathologist in Berlin and he uh, described something which we know now as Virchow's triad, which describes the our thinking of how venous thrombosis or thrombosis in general may um, occur. So we have the three components. The one component is the endothelial injury because the endothelial is in fact anticoagulant, but if the endothelial is uh, injured, then the endothelial may become a procoagulant surface. The next, uh, item is stasis. So anything which reduces or impairs the blood flow may also contribute to the pathogenesis of venous thrombosis. And then there is hypercoagulability, which means any changes in our coagulation system, which uh, increases the coagulation ability of the blood, which activates our hemostatic system. If we break this down into uh, concrete situations, into concrete risk conditions or risk factors, then we can uh, talk about the following. So, for example, patients with a family history of venous thrombosis are at an increased uh, risk because many of the risk conditions are inherited and so they are uh, to be found in the genes. Hospitalization, of course, you can easily translate any of the situations um, a patient may encounter in the hospital to one of the components in the in Virchow's triad. So the immobilization during the hospital stay will reduce the blood flow, will cause stasis, surgery, and so on and so on. Uh, treatments, um, chemotherapy. Decreased blood flow not often comes with, uh, not only comes with hospitalization, but also with uh, stroke, limited movement, injury to the leg, um, injury to a vein, often caused by fracture surgery or severe muscle injury. And an important chapter is uh, increased estrogens. Women are at particular risk uh, at younger age although their absolute risk is low, but they are at <clears throat> increased risk during birth control, hormone replacement or pregnancy. Age, we talked already about that, and then there are chronic medical conditions such as cancer, most important one, or inflammatory bowel disease, which also increase the risk for uh, venous thrombosis. But there are many more. This is shown in this picture, and you can easily um, uh, understand that venous thrombosis is a multi-causal disease because these risk factors are not to be found isolated one by one, but they interplay. There is an interplay between various risk factors and a venous thrombosis occurs if 
a combination of risk conditions or risk factors uh, come together at a very specific time point. So when we translate precision medicine to venous thrombosis, then we know that uh, precision medicine utilizes molecular information, phenotypic and health data from the patients to generate care insights to prevent or treat, and in our case, venous thrombosis, resulting in improved health outcomes. So if we uh, try to break this down and look what can we do here for venous thrombosis, then we are looking into coagulation disorders as risk factors. And we do have uh, a panel of coagulation uh, factors, most of which are uh, genetic with one exception, and this is uh, the lupus anticoagulant. Uh, the lupus anticoagulant is not um, an inherited risk factor, but this is a, an acquired coagulation disorder uh, which um, uh, poses a risk for venous thrombosis. If we focus on congenital thrombophilia, meaning congenital risk factors for a first venous thrombosis, then we have uh, the, the, these are the major ones. This is antithrombin deficiency, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, the prothrombin mutation, and the factor V Leiden mutation. What you can see here is on the x axis the frequency, the prevalence of these defects, and on the y axis the risk which is associated with these um, conditions. So you can see here that antithrombin deficiency is the strongest risk factor, but it has a very, very low prevalence. Uh, while, for example, the prothrombin mutation or also the factor V Leiden mutation, uh, which is fairly more common than these uh, mutations, are associated with a fairly low um, risk. So the stronger the risk factor, the, 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 the rarer it is. Uh, I just uh, pick out uh, the two more, most frequent uh, risk conditions, risk factors, uh, with a little bit uh, going a little bit more into detail. And so this is uh, factor V Leiden. Um, factor V Leiden causes APC resistance. I will show you in the next slide what APC resistance is, but let's focus a little bit longer on what factor V Leiden means. Most importantly, the, this mutation is named, as most of the mutations are, after the city where the patient was found or where the mutation was described, and Leiden is a city in the Netherlands. Uh, so it has nothing to do with the German word suffering, but it is the name of a Dutch city. It is a point mutation and it impairs the inactivation of factor V by activated protein C, so APC resistance. It is of autosomal dominant inheritance, and there are, of course, uh, heterozygous and homozygous carriers. So activated protein uh, C resistance, uh, protein C is a natural anticoagulant. Everybody of us has protein C in, in his or her system. And if you add um, activated protein C as an anticoagulant uh, to a sample, then you will find a prolonged clotting time uh, measured um, as the APTT. Uh, and activated protein C inactivates factor V and factor VIII. So what you do here is you just add APC to the sample, measure the APTT, uh, and divide this and you get an APC re uh, ratio. And in patients who are APC resistance, resistant, this addition of APC to the, uh, to the reagent does not um, uh, increase uh, the, the APTT because of this uh, uh, lack of inactivation of factor V. So then there is a, a uh, and another uh, mutation, the prothrombin mutation, which is also fairly common, less frequent than the factor V Leiden mutation. You find the factor V Leiden mutation in about 5% in the general population uh, in Central Europe, and 10% of patients in Scandinavia uh, carry the mutation. Um, factor uh, prothrombin mutation is less common, 1 to 3% in the general population. Uh, 
more frequent in the southern parts of Europe, less frequent in the northern parts of Europe, and you find it in 8 to 16 percent of thrombosis patients. And it is also a point mutation and it elevates the prothrombin levels in plasma. So there was uh, quite some advancement uh, in the uh, detection of novel thrombophilic conge uh, congenital thrombophilic factors, but then there was sort of a stop. And uh, during the last years, a lot of efforts have been made to come up with more genetic risk factors for venous thrombosis, but this was somehow futile. I just show you as an example the results of genome-wide association, uh, one of the genome-wide association studies, and you can see here that um, really nothing popped up, uh, nothing that we didn't know already about. So this is factor five line, this signal you see here, and this is non-O blood group. We also know this, that uh, people with uh, uh, blood group O have a lower risk, meaning that p uh, patients or uh, persons with non-O blood group have a somewhat higher risk for venous thrombosis. Then there were also exome array analysis done, very elaborate analysis from several parts of the world. So not only uh, Europe, but also um, in African Americans, mainly large cohorts. And again, uh, they did not come up with anything we, we did not know already. Factor five, of course, uh, the signal there is factor five Leiden. Uh, factor 11, we also know that fibrinogen, we have a little bit of information already about that and the blood group. So nothing new there. And uh, honestly, I personally doubt that we will find something uh, really uh, of uh, major importance in the genes in uh, with regard to coagulation factors, so in, in, in plasma. So I think we might find something in the venous wall in the endothelium, but not 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 there yet. Um, so, uh, what what uh, what does this now uh, um, mean? Uh, what is the relevance of congenital and acquired thrombophilia in venous thrombosis? So, for sure, it helps and improves our understanding of the pathophysiology of venous thromboembolism. Uh, it helps us uh, with uh, refining. Thrombo uh, thromboprophylaxis in risk situations in family members with known major defects. So since this, all of this is, um, most of these factors are genetic, we of course are able to counsel not only the propositus, but also family members. Uh, we can also advise uh, to avoid, uh, avoid additional risk factors. Uh, this is particularly important when it comes to uh, contraceptive measures. Uh, particularly in family members with known major defects, but there is limited relevance for the treatment of a first venous thrombosis, except in patients with antithrombin deficiency or antiphospholipid antibodies. So we would not change our treatment uh, of these patients uh, regardless of what of what defect or what um, condition we find, uh, only we might consider in patients with antithrombin deficiency under certain circumstances to provide an antithrombin concentrate. Uh, and uh, we know that patients with antiphospholipid antibodies who have a venous thrombosis uh, should not uh, be treated with direct oral anticoagulants, but they should be treated with uh, yeah, vitamin K antagonists. Uh, the congenital and acquired thrombophilia also has very limited relevance for deciding on the duration of anticoagulation. The question is how long should a patient be treated with an anticoagulant after his venous thrombosis? We know that anticoagulation is the only option to reduce the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism. The risk is fairly high, particularly in patients with unprovoked uh, that means spontaneous venous thrombosis. You can see here in our own cohort that the risk after 15 years is uh, 30%, um, even 40%, and after 20 years, uh, half of the patients will have a new event. The problem here is that we have to 
balance the risk of recurrence against the risk of bleeding during the anticoagulant treatment. And this is not so easy. And we have seen that the, um, that the only way out of this is that we can uh, use clinical data. So healthcare data, patient-related data, and not so much uh, molecular-based uh, data. For example, we can see here uh, that patients with a secondary venous thromboembolic event, for example, have a uh, much, much lower recurrence risk than patients with an unprovoked event. So this already helps us to predict the risk of recurrence. So if we know that there is a provoking factor, uh, we need to um, consider that there are per persistent risk factors, for example, cancer, and uh, then the patient needs long-term anticoagulation because the risk persists. But if the risk factor is only transient, for example, the thrombosis occurs after surgery, trauma, pregnancy, female hormone use, or immobilization, then we know that this risk factor goes away and then the recurrence risk is low and the anticoagulation can be stopped after three uh, months. In patients who do not have such a risk factor and have an unprovoked venous thrombosis, extended phase anticoagulation is uh, suggested to reduce the recurrence risk. But uh, we know that only one out of four patients will indeed have recurrence and we need to consider the bleeding risk, the costs, and the burden of everyday medication. And uh, there have been uh, attempts made to identify this one person uh, who really gets the recurrent event. And um, as I said, the thrombophilia screening, the genetic uh, uh, risk factor determination does not help us because in a in these patients, even if we screen for all these uh, parameters, uh, more than one third of patients do not have a, a thrombophilic risk factor, albeit they had um, two spontaneous thrombosis. So uh, we can, of course, use phenotypic and, and health data. And this is what we did when we uh, developed our Vienna prediction model. So. Here we do not have molecular markers, but we have uh, patient characteristics, like for example, the, the sex of the patient, the location of the thrombosis, and uh, a laboratory parameter, the D-dimer. And you can combine uh, these parameters, and then you get estimates of the recurrence risk, and you can advise the patients with regard to the recurrence risk, for example, in this man with the proximal deep vein thrombosis and the D-dimer of 330 micrograms per liter, the risk of recurrence is 18% after five years, and you can use these numbers to counsel the patient with regard to the duration of anticoagulation. So this is another way of precision medicine, not on molecular basis, but using clinical data, using patient-related data, and um, using uh, healthcare data. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Eichinger. It was really interesting um, presentation. So now we would go to um, questions. Uh, first one is um, the COVID vaccines from uh, AstraZeneca led to thrombotic um, thrombocytopenic um, uh, in some people. Can we expect such a complications with future viral vaccines? And what could be done to access the risk profile for individuals before receiving uh, vaccination? Yeah, the, you you have you have. Uh you have to clearly differentiate or you have to clearly uh, be aware of what really happened with this uh, uh, vector vaccine. This was not, uh, the, the, this was a very severe uh, coagulation disorder. This had nothing to do with the mechanisms of venous thrombosis, which I now described. 
the development of this disorder was completely different from any venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism you might get after, let's say, surgery or in childbed or uh, if you have a plaster cast. The patients who had this complication after the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccination, after the coronavirus vaccination, they first of all got a severe immunologic reaction. This immunologic reaction caused uh, platelet activation. This platelet activation in turn activated uh, the coagulation cascade. But uh, in the center of this whole process was uh, platelet activation. And then what happened was a special form of disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, DIC. And uh, so this is how it happened. And uh, this mechanism has nothing to do with uh, this general thrombosis. So there are no tests. We still uh, have no common risk factors, or we could not define any common risk factors in the cohorts of patients who got this complication after the uh, vaccination. There are no common features. They, the patients who already had a thrombosis before are not at an increased risk. Patients who, are, who carry the factor V Leiden mutation do not have an increased risk, um, nothing of that kind. And we only saw it with the vector vaccines, not with the M M mRNA uh, vaccines. Thank you very much for the explanation. So uh, next question would be, um, this is a broad question, but in all er your time at the Met Uni and taking care of many patients, um, cases with thrombosis, how um, has precision medicine improved the treatments and patients' quality of life? Uh, yes, I tried to, to, um, to focus on that a little bit in, in my presentation. So. Uh, we, we can, of course, I mean, it, it's always a question on, on, on what you mean by precision medicine, you know. You can, uh, if you break it down to just genetic markers, then, of course, we know several genetic uh, markers, uh, for example, or hereditary conditions, um, antithrombin deficiency, protein C, all of these are uh, genetic uh, risk factors, um, they, uh, they help us a little bit to uh, get a clearer picture, particularly in families with, um, with uh, a thrombotic tendency, to counsel the patients, to, um, to get more insight in what is going on, um, to avoid additional risk factors. Um, this, this helped a lot. Uh, but uh, we are more um, inclining towards clinical characteristics of thrombosis. These are much more helpful. Uh, with regards to treatment, we uh, just recently got very good information uh, on patients with antiphospholipid antibodies. This is, of course, not a genetic um, uh, disease, but uh, this has major importance if patients do carry or do have antiphospholipid antibody, then we cannot treat them as uh, we would uh, treat other patients with mainly direct oral anticoagulants, but we know that they uh, benefit from vitamin K antagonist patients with antiphospholipid antibodies. And of course, the duration of anticoagulation is uh, an era of um, uh, prediction models. Uh, we still are not there where we would like to be, but uh, I think that um, we, sh we need to do more on this uh, chapter, but uh, we will not uh, get any further with just genetic analysis. I think we need to combine um, clinical data uh, and patient characteristics, which is done in these prediction models. Okay, thank you. And then a third question. Um, it is very interesting to be able to predict risk of thrombosis uh, going further. Are there also some tools or biomarkers that uh, help to personalize the type of therapy and the dose that is administrated to the patient? 
Uh, yeah, we, uh, as I said, um, antithrombin deficiency is a, is a fairly good example because uh, we, we, we do have an antithrombin concentrate. And if we know that the patient has antithrombin deficiency, then we also know that the traditional treatment uh, with heparin, for example, would probably not work so well because uh, heparin just catalyzes uh, the, the action of antithrombin. So if a patient does not have enough antithrombin, then you can catalyze as much as you like. Uh, if there is not enough to be catalyzed, then the, the action won't be there. So um, to overcome this problem, uh, you can either increase the dose of heparin or you, in certain situations, you may consider giving, giving an antithrombin concentrate. In all other conditions, um, it, uh, the treatment is regardless of whether or not uh, there is a certain uh, defect. So you, 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 basic, you basically treat patients with the venous thrombosis the same way. When it comes to prophylaxis, and you know already that the patient comes from a family with a certain defect, or a patient, uh, you know, a certain defect in a patient, which has already been identified, then you might consider uh, adapting the dose, the prophylactic dose, which is usually low molecular weight heparin. Although you have to be very careful, because when you, whenever you change or increase the dose of uh, an anticoagulant, you also increase bleeding. So. This is a delicate balance, and you cannot do this uh, very liberally. So you have to really think about what you are doing and not saying, okay, I know this defect, and now I'm doubling the dose and uh, because this is such, such a problem. You have to be very careful. Okay, and, and now um, we still have uh, time for a new questions from the audience. So one of them is, um, Professor, um, I think, do you think uh, there should be a screening program for venous thrombosis? Um, with regard to screening for the disease or screening for risk factors? Oh, sorry, Let's, it's just general it doesn't, it does, It's not specific. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, w w let's, let's suppose um, a screening for risk factors is meant. Uh, Screening for risk factors for thrombosis, uh, particularly thrombophilia screening, is of no or little relevance. Um, why? Uh, you would not change your what you are doing with your patients, neither when it comes to prophylaxis nor when it comes to treatment, if a patient has one of these defects. If you have, uh, with two exceptions, this is antithrombin deficiency and uh, antiphospholipid antibodies. Then, as I repeatedly already said, uh, you have uh, options or you need to, to, to change or adapt your treatment. Uh, all of the other conditions would not um, influence uh, your, your thromboprophylactic measures because, as I said, if you increase the dose, then you might, must, consider, um, you must consider bleeding. And most of the risk factors are far too weak in relation to the clinical situation. So, for example, after surgery, surgery is such a strong risk factor that regardless of whether or not a patient has factor V Leiden, he needs or she needs thromboprophylaxis anyway. Yeah? So uh, given that these, most of the risk factors are fairly weak risk factors, other risk conditions are much, much stronger and um, you cannot, you cannot uh, change uh, uh, much of the anticoagulant concept. When it comes to the duration of anticoagulation, they are also of no help because uh, we and others saw that these uh, risk factors for a first thrombosis are not risk factors for a recurrent event. So there are other factors much more important like the sex of the patient, um, uh, the location of the thrombosis um, the, and um, the, the dedimer, 
which uh, are risk factors for, 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 rec for recurrence, particularly in those with unprovoked thrombosis. And those with provoked thrombosis, the provoking factor is all that counts. So, of course, you should uh, screen these patients, but you should not screen them so much for uh, genetic risk factors or also acquired laboratory risk factors, but you should screen them for clinical risk factors, for um, health characteristics, and so on and so on. And you should screen them for bleeding risk factors, because if a patient has an increased bleeding risk, mm -hmm. uh, again, you need to consider this and uh, relate this to, to the treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you very much once again for your uh, great talk, but please stay with us because this brings sure. us to the final part of our uh, colloquium. So now we have the podium discussion. I would like to invite all the speakers back into our chat. And unfortunately, Professor Sally had to leave due to a meeting, but we're very happy to have Professor Eichinger and Dr. Fenzel with us. And I also urge the audience to ask your burning questions now in our Slido chat. Maybe I can start with the first question. So Professor Sally, uh, in the starting kind of also described a little bit about the important thing in precision medicine is to have a good database in each country as it provides ideas for precision, precise treatments uh, for a particular population. So I would ask me, Professor Eichinger, is this uh, relevant to your research in Austria, for example, to have uh, such a database? And is it beneficial in your research in thrombosis? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that uh, this is a this is a a, a very uh, timely uh, question and a very timely argu argument uh, because um, I think that we will see a change in the landscape of uh, getting or how we how we achieve or how we get. Uh, adequate data with regard uh, to building evidence in what we are doing. Yeah, so I think that databases, large databases, um, is one of the of the tools we will need in the future. And uh, so, uh, also in 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 venous thrombosis, even if I say that we, I'm, I find it highly unlikely that we will find more in uh, the genetics in our coagulation system in the blood, this does not mean, mean that we will not find something in the endothelium or something in, 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 in the vessel wall in general. So, uh, and there definitely must be something genetic uh, somewhere because we know so many families that who clearly have familial uh, thrombosis, but in where we do not find any of the known defects. So uh, databases uh, will really be helpful. And databases not only have genetic information, but they have all sorts of laboratory information, and particularly also uh, other demographic and patient-related um, uh, information, and also information on, uh, on co-medications, comorbidities, which is very important in venous thrombosis. And we have to find a way to uh, link all this data and um, have um, uh, information also from bioinformatic, um, um, with bio bioinformatic input. Mm -hmm. So this will, be, okay. this will be a major challenge, uh, and this has already been tackled, this challenge. But of course, uh, you have to have good databases because this research starts with a good database. And uh, this sounds easy, but is very, very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we would ask also Dr. Fenn to comment on this since uh, you work on personalized immunotherapy. So how relevant is you to have uh, like um, extensive databases? For sure, also in our case, it's important to get as much information from our patients as possible. And we try to, to build this up already with, uh, with our biobanking system so that we collect not only uh, the patient blood sample, but also all uh, his patient history, his, his lifestyle, as I already mentioned before. 
And we also now extend this not only to blood, but also other body fluids, like patients are having uh, effusions, but we also plan to include like urine, uh, stool samples and so on to get really a whole picture. And this is what we try, that we share these samples within our sub-project as much as possible to get even at our stage now that we are like at the beginning or in now as much information uh, out of one patient as possible. But yeah, we will also have to build to have uh, a lot of information of all our patients. Surely, such things take quite a lot of time, but definitely very beneficial for precision medicine. And I would like to also lead to our next question then. Uh, what are some of the limitations you would think are in precision medicine in your own individual fields? So if I continue, I think a major challenge in our field is if you have rare tumor entities that you get enough patients. As, as you see, we, ha we had just for sarcoma 35 mm -hmm. patients by cooperation between us and another hospital. So I think especially in sarcoma, as you have many subtypes, it's really difficult to catch uh, all of them. And therefore, it's, uh, it's also the question, is, this, is our model then also valid? without having these patients and therefore I see a high need also for, uh, for, co uh, for collaborations between different universities to get as much patient material to also to cover uh, the rare events. Professor Eichinger, do you want to comment on this as well? Uh, yes, I mean, in venous thrombosis, we have the issue that this is, as I showed you, a very multi-causal <laughs> disease. So we have uh, many, 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 many risk factors um, and it's, it's then a uh, um, not, not only a question of defining new risk factors or defining all the risk factors, but then to, uh, to find a way to integrate the interplay of all these risk factors um, and to come up with the impact of this interaction uh, on, the, on, on, on the selected patient. So uh, you have uh, a numerous combinations. You have an old patient with a, a, a surgery, he gets an infection. You have a young patient, uh, she's on the pill, uh, she has a plaster cast, she travels on the plane. Uh, someone has a genetic uh, thrombophilia, uh, and so on, and so on, and so on. And you have to find a way to, uh, to measure the impact of these all of these uh, combinations um, on the individual risk, you can measure this more globally, uh, but uh, for a cohort, but the challenge is to really uh, say, okay, you now with this combination, your risk is as such. And you with this combination, your risk is the following. And then, you have to relate this to what uh, kind of intervention you want to do, yeah? Because uh, also the intervention in our field has uh, risks, and you have to again uh, calculate the risk. And in fact, this is mainly bleeding. You have to to relate this to the bleeding risk, and you can have to come up with personalized risk estimates for bleeding, and then. In the ideal world, you can balance or weigh these risks, and then you can come up with an individualized approach uh, of, your, of your intervention, meaning of antithrombotic treatment. And this is a challenge because we have so many risk factors. So um, we have still some questions from our audience, and um, one is for uh, Dr. Fenn. Um, so, as the tissue is sometimes hard to obtain, do you also plan to perform methylation analysis on other material, example RNA or cell-free DNA, and check for correlation with response to ECB? Uh, yes, uh, we plan to do this. So uh, I already mentioned, so we have tissue methylation and we are also trying now uh, the um, DNA methylation from leukocytes. 
But uh, besides blood, we're also are now working on uh, methylation of, uh, of DNA derived from, uh, from ascites. Uh, so we try to, to test all our, uh, our body fluids, whether uh, it's a valid approach. And uh, for some uh, of our projects, we are also comparing whether uh, the, our, uh, our, bio, uh, our liquid biopsy approach is uh, showing us uh, similar results uh, compared to the tissue samples, so whether uh, a liquid biopsy approach would be enough for the future to circumvent the necessity of having tissue samples. So we're here trying different approaches. Thank you very much. So um, in our discussion, we would also like to ask about prevention. I mean, Professor Eisinger already like elaborated on this, but maybe uh, Dr. Fent, you can comment on this, how your research can be implemented or um, can it be implemented to prevention, not only to treatment of the patients? So this is not right our focus right now. So I think there are, uh, there are better experts in the field of prevention here at Medical University, but um, maybe in the future that when we have the picture of how the patient responds and others have a model how, uh, how which risk factors, or, or not risk factors, um, yeah, uh, with another model that maybe we can combine those in, in one together. So maybe this could be a future valid mm -hmm. approach via collaboration with other groups who have a focus in this field. And this would lead me to then our final question. I would like to know more about how you see the future of precision medicine, because clearly this is the future now, and we are also having a lot of courses, especially in Medical University of Vienna itself, on molecular precision medicine. So we would like to know that how would you think the future is like, and how could we train our future doctors? Yeah, uh, definitely the the future is in in this uh, in in a in a personalized approach. Yeah, mm -hmm. where you uh, consider as many of the characteristics, I would say, of a patient with his disease or with her disease. So this means characteristics of the patient, and we can just come up with a very simple characteristic: is it a man or is it a woman? with this or that kind of disease, which already makes some uh, traumatic difference because uh, men, for example, when we are talking about venous thrombosis, have a higher risk of recurrence than women. So if you, if you, if you sit in front of a man with a pulmonary embolism, you immediately know that his recurrence risk is so high that you probably do not need to, to, to think twice uh, when it comes to uh, prolonging the duration of anticoagulation. While if you are sitting uh, in front of a woman, that makes a difference already. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And um, you, you have many, 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 many such uh, uh, characteristics, uh, variations in the disease, and by variations, I mean just, um, just uh, common variations. You have patients who have an infection on top of the specific disease. You have uh, patients who have some comorbidities on top of this specific disease. But then, of course, you have m many more uh, distinct differences within a certain disease. And you can break this down, 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 down to molecular characteristics and probably in the future even more um, in-depth uh, characteristics of a certain disease. And then you have to find a way to combine all this. And this is where the informatic uh, comes in and the, the statistics come in. And I think that the future, uh, at least for students, um, uh, should be to really focus also on data analysis, uh, data interpretation, uh, ways to analyze data, all these tools, uh, what can we do? And this in, in, ver in different uh, uh, categories, because it's, of course, you have to analyze or to be able to analyze all the output you get, for example, for, from genetic analysis. But then you have also to find a way to integrate all the characteristics and to shuffle them around and then to come up and say, okay, 
I have this woman with this kind of disease, with this comorbidities, with this comedication, with this history, with this family history, with this uh, um, characteristics of the disease, and then there is another characteristic and another char characteristic, and then you have to combine this. And then you come up with some sort of concept together with the characteristics of the intervention, because you also have your intervention has certain characteristics. For example, in venous thrombosis, you know, increases the bleeding risk, but the bleeding risk is particularly increased in patients, for example, who have thrombocytopenia or who have who need additional treatment or who have a liver disease or who are elderly or and so on and so on. And then you have to also integrate this into our model. And so you probably need to know also a lot of modeling uh, I learn a lot about modeling, particularly if you are in research. If you are applying all this, probably not so much, but if you are in research, you need to know a lot about these things. <laughs> That's very true. Thank you for your insight. Uh, Dr. Fendel, would you have any comment to this? Yeah, uh, I think it's also important to to raise the awareness for this uh, in, in, the, in the public, because without uh, this data, we can't provide precision medicine. And we are strongly depending on all our patients uh, um, participating uh, in our biobanking uh, system because without uh, their agreement, we can't, uh, we can't take and use their, their samples and their data to provide for future patients a better care. So I think this is also an important point uh, uh, to take out uh, to the public that we need to work together, not only here within the hospital, but also that uh, the patients help us to become better. Yes, that's very true. Thank you both so much for answering our questions and for speaking today at our colloquium. I would now with this like to uh, close the meeting. So what an enlightening session it has been and with our wonderful speakers and also very interactive audience. And so once again, huge thanks to all the speakers, also from my side for sharing with us uh, your research. We would also like to thank Medvini Vin uh, for continuously supporting us, uh, in particular the Cooperate uh, Communications Department for helping us to prepare for this event our colleagues from the YSA, and you, our audience today. I hope you enjoyed our winter colloquium and we wish you a nice evening. Thanks again for the invitation. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.